Thank you very much, Dave. Five minutes past eight here on the Phil Cowan Show, and very pleased to welcome a guest to the program. Welcoming back Dr. Derek Green of the Project 21 Leadership Network. It's been a while, but always a pleasure to have him on. Derek, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks very much. I know one of the things we wanted to talk about today was um, you had uh, written recently about uh, next week's uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday that it it feels as though, you know, more than ever. And tell me if you think I'm crazy, that it, it feels to me like it isn't unique this year because of all the Trump hatred out there. The day is kind of being hijacked by folks who want to protest Donald J. Trump, but it kind of feels to me, Derek, am, am I crazy to think it's kind of been headed that way for a while, that the MLK holiday, rather than honoring the legacy of Dr. King, has kind of just become the sort of catch-all excuse for political protest? A year of spot on uh, with that observation. I, I've been thinking about this for quite some time, that you know, as every year passes and the further away we get from Reverend King and the Civil Rights Movement and what they were able to accomplish, uh, the less significance that that day has. And, and I think that what has happened is that with getting further away from that date, you lose kind of the sense, the, the, the importance of the day, both, you know, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you fall on, you kind of lose that significance. But what has happened is that pe- people who are center left has, have used that day um, to advocate policies that I think stood against what Reverend King stood for. Uh, and in the process, like you, you mentioned, they have co-opted that day um, and used it as an umbrella or as a shield, more, more, more specifically, uh, to, to deflect what they're trying to do. And I think that, you know, if we're going to, to maintain um, the, the day's importance of, of what the country was able to accomplish, I think that we need to start fighting back against that, uh, that, that political uh, co-optation going forward. Well, and it also strikes me, and it's in a, interesting to have this discussion with you, y- your doctorate is in divinity, is it not? Theology and ministry, yes. Uh, that's what I thought. Um, it, it also seems to me, we tend to forget, many of us, um, that he wasn't just Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And right. the... the the farther we get from his passing, Derek, that it seems to me the farther we get away from his Christian message. Oh, no question about it. I mean, Reverend King was an ordained minister far, long before he, he received his Ph.D. And I think uh, another thing that people tend to forget, you know, with the constant um, referencing of, of his, his doctorate, uh, is that the, the civil rights movement and the centrality of his message was Christian character, Christian love, you know, Christian nonviolence in the face of physical violence and, and social and economic oppression. I think one of the things that has, has also happened is that people start to attribute the successes to the, of the civil rights movement to this Gandhian-inspired nonviolence. And though he used the Gandhian method of social resistance— that Christian nonviolence was central to that message, and so I, we, they've they de-Christianized, you know, his public ministry, um, and I and I think that that has, uh, you know, it, it's it's been a detriment to to us all <laughs> as a culture, to be to be quite honest. Well, and you know, it was an interesting point made by one of my listeners, Jeff, um, here a week or two ago uh, uh, regarding race and and Christianity, in that they. The, the point Jeff was trying to make was with the, the left is so bound up in identity politics and there there is no place, at least this was Jeff's opinion, I'd be curious to get your take on this, where race is less important, or should be at least, than in the church, where the only metric ought to be, do you believe or do you not? I think Jeff, Jeff's observation is spot on. I mean, I, th- I think when you get down to the Christian message, you see that the Christian message is transracial, meaning it supersedes any type of racial barriers that we may set up for ourselves. Uh, it's also transnational, right? You read the Bible, particularly in Revelations, we see that the end times church is going to be populated and consisting of people from all races in all nations. And so when we get into the church, we should start focusing or refocusing on the message of 
loving thy neighbor. When when we get the command to love our neighbor, we're not commanded to love our neighbor if he or she shares the same racial composition as us. You know, if we're supposed to do unto others, there is no racial uh, mandate in that to only do unto others if they share the same type of racial composition or, in this case, racial oppression uh, as us. We're supposed to do unto others and love our neighbor regardless uh, of those man-made barriers. And so I think that we need to kind of refocus our message, get back into the Bible, and start teaching people that these types of you know racial dynamics that have been created and emphasized uh, politically that have made their way into the church are doing a detriment to our culture, but it's doing a detriment to the Christian faith. And I think that, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've even seen it now, even on uh, the center-right politics, where people who self-identify as conservatives are starting to behave in ways that were once, at least in my lifetime, my recognition, was almost reserved for people who were on the center-left. And so I don't want to have people who are self-identified uh, Christians and, you know, conservatives. Actually, let's not even, you know, descend into politics. If you're a self-identified Christian, these types of barriers and these types of behaviors, uh, we shouldn't be engaging in them. You know, and I, and I think that we need to, again, refocus our, our message on what Jesus taught uh, in the message that, that, that extends from Genesis to Revelation. Well, and by extension, through Dr. King and and his teachings. Um, if, if we can get, get back to the political for a moment, though, I know one of the things that y- you express some puzzlement about is the fact that people want to use this day as a day to protest tax cuts, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, or, or to protest the economic policies of this administration, because, Derek, they seem to be uh, benefiting the African-American community. No question about it. No question about it. it it's, it's just really it's, – it's, surpri- it's shocking but not surprising that they would use the day, again, to politically co-opt it to protest you know, you know, legislation that has, has been put in place uh, to, to strengthen the economy. Again, we're looking at black unemployment being at a 45-year low. In the last several months, black unemployment has reached two, the 17-year lows two separate times. Black un- teen unemployment has reached a 17-year low as well. Now we're getting tax cuts that are going to be putting more money into the pockets of more people, uh, particularly black Americans, who are now working um, in greater numbers than ever before. And Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats want to go out and, 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 and protest that. That seems to be counterproductive um, from top to bottom, and it just doesn't make much sense, one, why she would do that, but, but secondly – I don't think it makes much sense. I don't know why this current administration isn't touting this reality, this economic reality, particularly as it relates to black Americans, much louder, much stronger, and much more consistently than he's doing. This this is a very, very good accomplishment. Uh, that, that that is happening under his administration. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I see a few mentions of it here and there, uh, just uh, as as part of news coverage, particularly more often than not on on conservative news sites. But I don't hear the administration tooting this horn, and frankly, I think they should be. Absolutely, absolutely. He he made that statement when he was running for president, when he was trying to reach out to Black Americans to say, "What the hell do you have to lose by voting for me?" And, of course, the usual suspects in the Democrat Party and the Congressional Black Caucus condemned him for that. All of a sudden now, that you know, blacks weren't all poor. You know, until he said that, Democrats like to treat blacks as a collective group. But now, after he said that and he spoke the truth, they wanted to con- condemn him for saying that and tried to project upon him a racism that I don't think exists. Now, under his administration, and we can, there's a lot to complain about. You know, that's happened under President Trump, but this is not one of them. And this is what he should go out and, 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 and talk about consistently. Remember when I said this? Well, now look at the fruits, uh, you know, that, that my administration bears and whether he deserves all the credit or none of the credit. He's the president. He has the bully pulpit. So he can assume the credit. And he should be going out and saying this consistently. Look what else can happen if you support my administration. Uh, you know, and, and and celebrate this, and I just it just puzzles me why he doesn't do that. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that is a messaging shortcoming of this administration, at least up until this point. Our guest is Derek Green uh, from the Project Twenty One Leadership Network. Derek, can you stick around for one more segment? Absolutely, I would appreciate it. Thanks very much. Got to catch a break here. We'll have more with Derek Green. 
right after this, 14 past 8 a.m., 1380, The Answer. Thinking about life insurance? What if you could make one free phone call and learn your best price from nearly a dozen highly rated price competitive companies? Well, that's exactly what happens when you call SelectQuote Life. For example, George is 40. He was getting sky-high quotes from other companies because he takes meds to control his blood pressure. But when I shopped around, I found him a 10-year, $500,000 policy for under $25 a month. I'm SelectQuote agent Dan Savino. And believe me, if SelectQuote isn't shopping for your life insurance, you're probably paying too much. For a free quote, call 800-523-3771. That's 800-523-3771. 800-523-3771. Or go to SelectQuote.com. Since 1985, we shop, you save. Get full details on the example policy at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. Your price could vary depending on your health issuing company and other factors. Not available in all states. What's cooking, David? Hello, Coach. Like many people I overindulge during the holidays, I'm starting a low-carb, high-protein diet, and Roseville Meats is a perfect place for those of you whose resolution is to lose some of those holiday pounds. We have six-ounce portions of boneless, skinless chicken breast on sale at $4.99 a pound. Two per package, eight per bag. They can be prepared in a variety of ways, either on the grill, in the oven, or in a skillet. Try some of our 50-50 blend of ground beef and ground turkey. We mix equal parts of beef and turkey breast, grind it like regular ground beef. It makes great meatloaf tacos in any other dish where you've used ground beef. We're your modern day old fashioned meat market at 700 Atlantic Street in Roseville. Check out our website at rosevillemeats.com Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. It's time to get back in shape. Roseville Meat Company Fire up the grill Your modern day old fashioned meat market Fire up the grill coach. Fire up the grill From the Big Mountain Heating, Air and Solar Traffic and Info Center Charlie Simons. Sure, looking slow coming up from Elk Grove, 99 and I 5. Both a bit of stop and go until you get to the 50 connector. 50 itself slow going, starting at Bradshaw until you get to 99. Hey, 80 heading eastbound. We had that problem at the uh, Greenback Lane off ramp. Now we have a stall that is, for some reason, affecting traffic all the way up to Auburn Boulevard. Something you want to let us know about, or maybe you know about that situation. It's the Lexus of Sacramento traffic tip line, 830-3077. Oh, thank you, Max. Just popped up here. There's two vehicles in the number two lane, one in the number three lane. Unable to move the vehicles. Bad accident. And a SIG alert just being issued. That's what's happening. 80 eastbound between Greenback and Auburn Boulevard. That's how you're driving? I'm Charlie Simons. Reverse. Drive. Go, go, go. Oh, no. No go. What to do? Who can fix it? They can. Who? The transmission nerds. That's who. At the House of Automatic Transmissions. Google it. Ready or not, here comes more. Phil Cowan on AM 1380, The Answer. 18 past 8. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Our guest this half hour is Derek Green of the Project 21 Leadership Network. Dr. Derek Green. And, uh, you know, Derek, we were talking about the um, the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, which is uh, coming up on Monday. And, you know, in particular, I find it odd, and I don't know, maybe you have an answer to this or, or some thoughts as to how we break through this intellectual inconsistency that Dr. King's message was, quite famously, he said, I want my kids judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And his message was consistently, you cannot treat people monolithically based upon their race or any other immutable characteristic. Yet... Every year on when we honor his birth, that appears to be the practice is that we we encourage black Americans to keep acting monolithically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. You're right. And I think 
I think there's a number of reasons why that is. I think, I think, as you stated, King's message and the, and, the, and the central principle of the civil rights movement was 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 racial neutrality. Racial neutrality. Race doesn't mean anything. We want to deal with people based on their on their on their individual characteristics. I think what happened was after Reverend King was was assassinated, you had this void, and that void was filled. You know what, what became the Black Power movement, which you know, transitioned away from racial neutrality to racial solidarity and wanting to be addressed solely by race. And I think that what has happened is that the civil rights movement died, but the civil rights establishment uh, took its place, and that establishment wants to be treated primarily and solely by race. And I think that you see that a lot within black Americans, but also in the nature of, of racial identity politics that the left uh, nurtures and reinforces. And so you know, if we're ever going to get to the point where that dream is e- even more of a reality than it is now, I think that we have to, one, re- you know, re-embrace that principle of racial neutrality. But two, and, and this, I've, I've gotten a lot of blowback from this, but I think that blacks need to individually and then collectively finish the job of integration. Um, and that's integrating into American society. We're going to be American blacks. We're no longer going to be this hyphenated ethnic hodgepodge of African American. We're going to embrace this country, warts and all. We're going to make the most of the position uh, that we're in in this country that has been, you know, over the last 50 years, the best to any blacks at any time, <laughs> at any point in history. Uh, we need to embrace that and finish the, the, the process of integration to fully realize you know, what Reverend King gave his life for. And is that, well, th- this idea of being Americans first, I, I think is an interesting concept because I, one of the things that I think um, resulted in Donald J. Trump's success in this campaign was that he spoke to a love of country nobody in American politics had spoken to for quite some time. Is is that love of country as present in the in the black community as it ought to be? Uh, amongst some, yes. Um, um, you know, amongst the majority, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I guess we can only gauge that based off some of the rhetoric that comes out of pockets and uh, of black communities across the country. Um, I think that that what has happened is that, and again, I think this is where the churches have failed. But I think that politics has come come into this void where the church has failed and, uh, you know, encouraged and celebrated, uh, you know, nurturing of this hatred of what has happened to blacks collectively, you know, pre-1965. And I think that that has been a detriment to blacks because we've held on to this anger uh, and nurtured it and, and, you know, wanting to blame black frustration and black failure on this, you know, continuation of, of racism rather than saying, Racism is going to continue to exist on this side of heaven, but it's not going to stop us from realizing, you know, what our ancestors wanted to accomplish. It's not going to stop black development. It's not going to stop black flourishing. Uh, And so we see that, but we're going to press on in spite of it. Uh, And so, you know, I think that we have to get over this this anger and and this hatred uh, and and again, refocus on a Christian principle called forgiveness, you know, forgiving what has happened to us in the past and not holding it against people who may not have done anything to us. Uh, And until we get rid of that anger and start re-embracing forgiveness and then saying, we're here, let's make the most of it, you know, we're going to continue to see this, this charade year in and year out. Well, and I, uh, we, we're back around to this issue uh, of Reverend King's message, not just Dr. King's message, but Reverend King's message. And, and I guess my question is, has the civil rights movement in general turned its back on that Christian message? Yes. Yes. I think, I think again, you know, poll after poll shows, it continues to show that the most religious demographic in America are black Americans. It's, it's just the way it has been. Uh, but the problem, in my opinion, in my study, in my experience, is that the religion of leftism has also infiltrated the church, and there's two competing gospels. And I, I think that we have gotten away from the Christian gospel and then really embraced uh, the gospel, you know, of, of political leftism. And I think that has been, a, a, it's, I think the effects of that 
um, are unavoidable and undeniable. And I think that if we're going to get back to any sort of moral, political, social credibility amongst black Americans individually and then collectively, again, we have to go back to these basic principles. Um, and, and and I don't see that happening, uh, you know, in, in the next 10 to 15 years, sadly. I, uh, my hope is uh, <laughs> on top of this moral redemption, you know, my, 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 my hope is that the younger generation um, – sees race differently. Uh, they don't put as much emphasis on it, you know, and they start to re-embrace these Christian principles. But we're going to need men and women of faith to demonstrate and model those Christian principles to make them attractive to, to younger people uh, for them to want to accept them. Well, and it's interesting to note, too, I, you know, the, this um, this struggle be, between, uh, you know, the, the Church of Leftism and, and the Church of Christ, it, it's not just in predominantly black Christian churches, but Christianity in general, I think, is struggling with the same thing. Gosh, the Catholic Church has struggled with it for years. And, and in many ways, Derek, I don't see leftism as being compatible in many ways with Christianity. It isn't compatible, and I think on, on many issues, again, and that's a good point, it doesn't necessarily affect only black Christians. It affects the American church and, and the, you know, the, the different partitions um, as well. Uh, but it, it, when you take it issue by issue, there's issues that are simply incompatible, and it's, I, I call it a false gospel. So what happens is if you're going to have two competing gospels, the Bible says you cannot serve two masters. You're going to have to choose between one and the other. And I think that we've seen, regardless of color, uh, Christians in America choosing this false gospel that they've tried to synthesize, uh, you know, into the Christian gospel, choosing that above some of the things that, that you know, Jesus taught uh, and what Paul reemphasized. And so, you know, that's very, very dangerous. And I think, again, with that happening, that is one of the reasons why politics is supplanting Christianity as the religion, America's, you know, civil religion. That is that is why we have not done our due diligence um, in, 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 in articulating that gospel and embodying it in a way that, that makes it attractive. Uh, so you're right. I think there may be some darker days ahead, but the pendulum, you know, generally swings back. And so that's, that's, that's my hope, that it swings back sooner rather than later. But, you know, uh, <laughs> With my optimism is a very healthy dose of cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I let you go, because I'm going to have to break for news here, uh, with uh, the Reverend King's uh, Day of Honor coming up here, how would you hope to see Americans honor Reverend King? You know, I would, I would, I would say, you know, stop marching. You know, the march, the marches have passed. I, I would say that if we're going to honor Reverend King, let's first go back to the gospel that he preached. He was a sinful man, but yet and still the gospel that he preached was central to everything that he did in his public ministry. So let's go back to the basics first. Second, let's re-embrace the principle of racial neutrality. Yes, evils have been done to us individually and collectively. We can't do much about what has happened in the past, but we can sure control our fate going forward. So let's re-embrace racial neutrality, finish the process of the task of integration, and, and, and be American blacks, you know, go, go and honor him in this way, not co-opting it and inverting what he gave his life for uh, to bring our, um, our, our, our culture uh, and our society further apart, divided, uh, seemingly irreparably along racial lines. That's what I would say. All right, Derek Green, always a pleasure. Good to hear from you, young man. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good weekend. All right, you do the same. Thanks a lot.